Hey ladies, welcome to night three of Permission Conference Replay. Permission Week has been going so well. I hope you guys have been tuned in, engaged, and sharing this stream with your friends. This was really on PJ's heart to share this um, conference with the world because it was so impactful for the people that were in the room and I know it's going to impact you in the same way. So go ahead, get comfortable, get ready because tonight the word is coming from Katie O'Reilly Speaks Kazadi. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you like I'm telling you, this this is a word you do not want to miss. So I'm going to pray for us and then we'll jump in. God, I'm so excited for what you're going to do tonight. Thank you so much for this conference. Thank you for the lives that were changed. And thank you for the lives that you're about to change through this worship and this word. God, we love you. We're so excited for your move. We ask that you would bless this, break it, and multiply it, and do with it what you will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's jump in. We can't help but sing to you, Jesus. You've been so good. Ah, ah. Ooh, something marvelous happened to me. I was a prisoner. Your love me free ah, I was blind in unbelief and you made me see hallelujah hallelujah and I am living proof my God is on the move and there's nothing
I'm so excited that this woman that I gave invitation to said yes. About, what well, it was 2015, I was, I was pregnant with our second son and I happened to go to a conference. Had never met this lady before. When she began to speak, I was talking about it earlier, it was more than what she said. There was something on the inside of me that was awakened by the power and the clarity of her voice, her sound. She was so sure. She was so sure about who he was to her. I pray that the same thing that she did for me, that she does for this room tonight. This lady has never left the two miracle children that she had, has right now, ever before, before today. She came to this conference. She has a five-year-old. This is the first time she's ever left her children in five years to be in this room. I'm just telling you, get yourself ready. Miss Katie Oriya speaks. It's going up. It's going up. Y'all give some praise. It's going up. My God. My God. Come on in this moment. I mean, I could care less if you leave this place and you never know my name, but for one moment, can we honor the name that is above every name? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, we have come all this way for you. This world has nothing for us, and neither does this room. Not one single personality or person or voice has one thing to offer us. You are the only one who has what we need. And we came all this way to get a little closer. I'm praying tonight, this afternoon, for women who press their way through unforeseen circumstances, who made sacrifices and said no to things so that they could afford to come here. And God, I'm praying right now for the woman who feels like she's in the back and alone and didn't get the VIP, and I'm praying for that woman that she would leave here feeling never more seen by God than she was today. So Lord God, in this moment, we acknowledge that our lives are a disaster without your leadership and without your lordship. And so today, God, I pray that your daughters would lean in, not to my voice, because I left my voice behind the stage. But I pray that they would lean in with their spirit to hear the spirit of God. And I declare fruit, much fruit, more fruit, and fruit that remains. I declare that women will walk out of this place whole not just for them but for the world that needs them so everything you started father finish it today would you finish it today we wait for you and we eagerly expect to hear your voice in jesus name amen 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 i am um i'm i'm so honored jackie um before I get started, if I can figure out how to open this. Um, I want to say that, I wanted to say that I'm so proud of you. And then, and then God corrected me. And he said, no, I want you to tell her that I'm so proud of her. And I, um, every time I have talked to you, I sense the overwhelming pleasure of the Lord. That God is so pleased with you. And I shudder to think what this world would be like if you never stepped out in faith to be the woman that God called you to be. And if I ever had any part to play in that, then that will be one of the greatest testimonies of my life. Because when I met you, you weren't doing any of this, but all of this was already inside of you. 
It was already in you. And as I prepared and found myself praying for these beautiful women, I found myself praying for you. And I feel like uh, my, my word for you is that the purity of your heart, I told you I said yes before I knew anything about who was coming or anything else, because pure people birth pure things. And that is the only place that I want to be. And I know that you're pure and you're pure in heart, and I felt this, the Lord saying just to, to tell you that the one thing that the enemy is going to come for, he's going to leave your marriage alone, he's going to leave your kids alone probably, he's going to, there's going to be opportunities and success and all these things, but the one thing that the enemy is coming after with all of his might is the purity of your heart. And I'm telling you that because I feel like God wants to open your eyes. You're going to have to be so aware. And it, will, it has never mattered more the environment that you put yourself in, the people you align yourself with, or the people that you attach with. Because everything that God wants to do on earth is attached to the purity of your heart. So I'm praying that there would be like a wall of fire around you that no unclean thing because it happens so subtly nobody thinks that the purity of their heart is going to be defiled it happens so suddenly and I'm praying and declaring God in the name of Jesus not so God we pray you would protect her from every attack of the enemy I pray there would be set a guard around her heart oh Lord in Jesus name I pray you would give her eyes to see it and I feel like the Lord wanted me to tell you that because when you are aware of something, you are less vulnerable to it because you see it coming. He's coming for your heart, but he cannot touch it. He can't touch it. And everything God births through you is going to be attached to the purity of your heart because your heart is right and your motives are right and you have decided that I don't care if everyone celebrates me on earth if I go home and know God is not pleased I don't want it and because you have made up your mind to not live for their approval and for his alone God says that you are going to get both that you will get both because he can trust you with it you could be, and so in days when you find yourself, I'm not sure if I'm qualified anymore, I'm not sure if it's too much, God says the only thing you have to do is make yourself trustworthy, and that is all. If you can stay trustworthy, if I can keep trusting you, I will keep using you, and that is the, the thing I hear God saying to you today. I am so honored ooh, to be in this place, and I want you ladies to know that as I've been preparing, I have carried you in my heart. And I have felt like I've seen you without seeing you. And so the word that I have for you today, it's interesting. I preached this one time. And my natural inclination is like, yo, no, I want a fresh word. I don't want to know, give no recycled nothing to nobody. Speak to these people, Lord. But about a year ago, I preached this message one time. And as soon as I finished preaching it, it was such a unique word for our house. I mean, there was all this crazy stuff. God did something so unique that I kind of left and I thought, I'll probably never preach that again. It was just like for a moment. And then a second voice come and said in my head, except for maybe a woman's conference. It was almost a year ago. A few days later, Jackie Green called and said, would you do my women's conference? And so I knew already, and that's the funny thing, is that we think that we're making plans, but God has made them long before. And so I, um, I'm going to come to you today with this word and, and believe God to bear much fruit. You don't know me. I want to just thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Just consider me your light skin sister. Now you know. Y'all didn't know you were coming to the light skin session, but here we go. <laughs> um, but I'm just going to be me, okay? That's all I know how to do. I'm not nobody else, and I'm a Bible teacher, so in a moment when I read, I'm going to read a lot of scripture, and you're going to deal with it, because you're stuck here anyway with me, and I think you're going to love it, okay? We're going to read um, a lot of word in just a moment, but I want to just say thank you for leading to me and listening, even though you don't know me. My name is Katie Kazadi. Um, they're going to throw you a picture of my beautiful family. Uh, look, look at those babies. 
Uh, I guess I sent them the wrong quality. I sent them the wrong quality. You're going to have to take my word for it. They're cute. They don't really look like, like that. That's not how I meant for that to happen. It's fine. <laughs> so follow me on Instagram, and you will see what my kids really look like. Anyway, um, those, that's the miracle that uh, the miracles God gave me. But really, my whole life has been a miracle. Um, on May 16th was the original day that I preached this message. And as I was preparing to preach it, the Holy Spirit woke me up in the middle of the night because he's rude. And I was like, like, there's so many hours in the day. But it's okay, fine. I feel like he always does that. I remember one time saying something like that to the Holy Spirit, and he was like, well, that's for all those nights you kept me up all night crying and whatever. Now I'm, okay, okay. But he woke me up, and um, I just heard this voice in my head, you're preaching on May 16th. And I'm like, I know this. Why are you telling me this? And within seconds, he said, no, you're preaching on May 16th. And within seconds, I did a math equation that I had never done before. I was born on May 2nd when I was 13 days old. They took me to the hospital at 15 days old. They told me, excuse me, at 13 days old, they told my mom to go home and plan my funeral because I would not make it through the night. So May 16th was the day I was supposed to die. <laughs> he said, you're preaching May 16th. I was like, oh, you can wake me up for this. That's fine. <laughs> it was interesting because of the topic that I was already planning to preach. And I realized I'm preaching on the day that I was supposed to die. And when I didn't die, they told my parents that they would wish I had died because my quality of life would be so bad. I wouldn't walk, talk, be severely mentally handicapped. I had spinal meningitis, both viral and bacterial at the same time in 1980 with no nothing and staph infection. And they didn't catch it in time either. There was no solution. My doctors wouldn't come into my room. The CDC was called. We all know who they are now. Back then, it's like Center for Disease Control. They had to come in because it was like, we can't have like an epidemic of this breakout. We just, our doctors won't come in. We just gotta let this little girl die. And um, they, were, they would get angry with my mom almost and just like, why won't you go home? And my dad would stay and my dad was a pastor. My parents, he would stay at home with my sister. My mom would stay at the hospital and sing. There was power, power, wonder working power in the blood. And they prayed and they asked God for a miracle. And the day I was supposed to die, I lived. And then when they said, when they said that uh, she would wish I hadn't lived, I would never do anything. When I, by the time I was five years old and I went doc to a doctor for a checkup, they did not believe my parents. They thought they were crazy, made her send for my medical records and said there's no way in the world that this little girl was ever in that condition. This is absolutely impossible. And they said it's called a miracle. And I grew up hearing the story about how I was supposed to die. And I was like, oh, if I hear this one more time, oh my goodness. It didn't really mean that much to me when I was younger. And there came a certain point, though, that it became more meaningful than I could imagine because I was wrestling as a young girl with what was the point of life. And why I'm even here. This life is too hard and there's just nothing in it for me. Why, why am I here? I'm, and then May 16th would come to my mind, and I, and I knew somehow, some way, that God did too much to keep me here, that there had to be a purpose for my life. So May 16th, the day that the devil tried to engrave on my tombstone, became the day that God engraved upon my heart. And it was the thing that reminded me when nothing else in life did that I was here for a purpose. But if I'm honest, I knew there was a purpose, but the hard part was figuring out what in the world is purpose? How do I find it? Does it come? Does it go? What is this elusive thing called 
purpose, and it led me on a search, and I'll be honest, church didn't help me, it confused me, books didn't help me, they confused me, I mean, I, I did the studies, I tried to understand purpose, and it was just this elusive thing I couldn't quite understand, and so today, I want to go to the scripture, and I want to have the audacity to sort of tackle this idea of purpose. Anybody in here ever wrestle with what your purpose is, and how to fulfill it? I'm in the right room, thank God. And so like us, this is the only message I have if it's not you. So, <laughs> it's not you, tell your friends, <laughs> okay? So, if I missed it, I missed it, God still loves you. First Samuel chapter one, I'm gonna read like a whole entire chapter of the Bible. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. All right, I'll try to uh, use my New York accent to make it more interesting, but. Um, Okay, thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. There was a certain man, and you guys don't know me, so just so you know, if I can't pronounce something, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just skip it, because I'm not trying to be up here, make myself look <laughs> crazy. If I, I'm not doing that. Be up here like this, the, the, the Sadukis and the Pharisees. The <laughs> okay. So we're going to start. I don't know if you can read it, but I'm going to read it out loud. There was a certain man from Ramathane, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jerohoam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, and the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. You understand where I'm coming from right now? Okay. Anyway, he had two wives. Okay. One was called Hannah and the other was called Penina. Mm, Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Zip, zilch, zero. Year after year, after year, I added that one, after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. And whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. Aww. And the Lord had closed her womb. Hmm. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. And this went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and would not eat. Can you imagine what she had to say, the kinds of things she had to be saying to her in order to make her weep until she could not eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why, aren't you, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? He's kind of making them about himself, but it's fine. Once they had, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. And in bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow, saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember her, remember me and forget and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. And she kept praying to the Lord. And Eli observed her mouth moving. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice wasn't heard. And Eli thought she was drunk. And he said to her, how long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Don't take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. And Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And she said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. And early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and went back to their home in Ramah and Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife. Mm -hmm. And the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. 
And when the man Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and fulfill his vow, Hannah didn't go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord and he will live there always. And verse 24, so after he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine. She brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And when they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli. And she said to him, as surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you, praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child. And the Lord has granted me what I asked of him, so now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Then Hannah prayed and said, my heart rejoices in the Lord. Okay, so let's break this down to real life, okay? Let's talk about this whole text and what's happening here. So the picture that we see painted here is a very vivid picture, right? Um, for scripture, this is a lot of detail about a person. We don't usually get to know so much about a person. So when we read this, there is an obvious picture being painted that God is wanting us to see. And there is one obvious thing for us that we all know. You cannot read this and not know this. That this girl really wants a baby. She has for a long time. Hasn't changed. She still wants a baby. And she is being ridiculed by her rival. This is what we know. Now what we do need to know also is that um, the significance of barrenness in this time is not what it is in this time. There is no way for us to fully grasp how significant it was to be barren in this time. In this day and age, if you were barren, it was considered the judgment of God. There must be something about you that we don't know that God does. Because he's not trying to trust you with no kids. If you were barren, why are you even here taking you know, space on the earth, your whole job? You don't leave the house. You stay in that house. You take care of your husband. You take care of that house, and you give him babies. And if you cannot give him babies, you have absolutely no place in society. God's judged you. Something about you we don't know. So there was so much. There was so much stigma attached to it on top of the natural feelings of sorrow when you cannot bear children. There was something so much more layered and deep that she was dealing with. We know that she was married to her husband for at least 10 years before he finally took Penina as a wife. 10 years of trying and trying and, and wanting to give your husband a son and feeling like you're failing at the one thing you're supposed to be able to do. And everywhere you go, you are isolated and people talking about you and, and judging you. And you don't, you don't understand what's going on. 10 years. And now he marries Penina. Now on top of the desperation, now you have an additional at least four or five years now of agitation. Additional four or five years of accusation on top of the isolation, on top of the sorrow. And so it's impossible to read this if you have any soul inside of your body and not feel for Hannah. Every time we read it, you feel for her. You're like, why is this happening to her? I can't stand Penina. I want to punch her in the face right now. Penina, that girl right there. And Elkin is over here talking to Hannah like, why am I not? And I'm like, you're talking to the wrong wife, bro. If you don't shut that heifer up right there, why? Just run in her mouth. Exert your male authority elsewhere. Come on, bro. He just letting her just 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 triggering her and traumatizing her year after year. And we're all, all on her side and, and we want so much for her. And then all of a sudden we read something that is hard for us to swallow. And we read, we go, why is this happening? What's going on? And the text says, God raises his hand. And it says, because of me, the Lord closed her womb. And in case you weren't clear on it, he raises his other hand and says it again. And he says, it was the Lord who closed her womb. And this is troublesome for me. It tampers with my theology. It threatens 
my theology because all of the pain and the suffering she's feeling is triggered by her barrenness. And if God has caused her barrenness, has he caused her pain? And if he's a good God, why would he do something like it tampers with my theology? So I need to go to God and ask him, why would you close her, her womb? Not because God owes me an answer, but because when God tells me something about himself, he is inviting me to know and see something about him that I did not already no, so I approach the text, not like he owes me an answer, but please tell me more because this does not seem like the kind of God that you are. So I want to wrestle today with the why. Why would God close her room? But in the meantime, we just need to know this one thing is that in all of her pain and her distress, it is God's hand that is locked up her womb. And if you can see a womb, his hand is covering it. And try as they might, nothing is getting past his hand. His hand is hovering over her womb. He's got his hand on a hole that nothing can fill. And now it's time for the annual trip to Shiloh. This is the one time a year we all gonna act like a big happy family. Me and him and, you know, Penina and all her kids going to come. We're going to make this long trip. We're going to get to the top of the hills, like a really long, and then there's like this leveled off place where the Ark of the Presence is. We're all for sacrifices. we all going to sit dinner like one big happy family and pretend like we're religious, even though we're dysfunctional. We're going to eat together, and we're going to do all this stuff. And then when it's all done, you know, then we'll go back home. And one thing you need to know about this annual journey is that it's 14 miles 14 miles of listening to other little kids call your husband daddy. 14 miles. 14 miles of looking in the face of everything that you think God has robbed you of. 14 miles of being agitated, 14 miles of wondering if God has forsaken you or forgotten you, 14 miles of trying to hold your peace, 14 miles of, of watching them and, and being belittled and feeling like you have no significance, 14 miles of accusation, 14 miles. It's a long time to cry and weep until you cannot eat. 14 miles with a hole that nothing has ever been able to fill. And now the whole dysfunctional family is gathered around the table, like, oh, God bless you, everybody. Hey, we're just here for our religious sacrifice. We got our church clothes on. We're gonna sit around and eat. And every year, Hannah is sitting at the same table where she has sat every single year. And every year, she has left crying till she cannot eat. Every year she has sat at the table of comparison, looking in the face of everything she feels like she wants, but God has withheld from her. Every year, the sitting at the table of comparison, looking around at what you don't have. And this day, though, there is a different thing that happens. She's always sat through this dinner and then just gone home. But something in the text happens that after all these years, there is a shift. Something happens and it says, then Hannah stood up. Hannah got up. She left the table and she left the dinner early, said, you guys can go here and party. And she gets up with urgency. See, she looks around the table and she says, you know what? I'm done sitting at the table of comparison because just because God hasn't given me what he's given you doesn't mean he has nothing for me. It just means I'm sitting in the wrong place. I'm going to get up and I'm going to move from this place. And instead of sitting here at the table of comparison, she throws up the deuces and says, I'm going to the table of the Lord because this is as close as I ever get to the presence of God. And while I'm here, I'm not sitting at this table when I have permission to get up from the table. Something, something 
shifted and she and she pushes her table away and remember the ark of God's presence is here in Shiloh this is the closest she will ever get to the presence of God she doesn't have the access that we have to God's presence and his voice and she says why would I waste a trip here sitting here at the table of comparison when I could run to the table of the Lord and so she runs to the temple and you remember that it is God's hand for 14, 15, 16, maybe 17 years. God's hand has been on her womb. And after all these years, her tears hadn't moved it. Her silent depression hadn't moved it. Her isolation hadn't moved it. Her pity parties hadn't moved it. Her feelings and her, her feelings hadn't moved it. Nothing has moved it. Her frustration hasn't moved it. Her agitation has it moved it her being misunderstood has it moved it but on this day something happens so much that his hand is on her womb but always remember God's hand is connected to his heart and so something happens in this prayer that nothing else has moved it but she says something that moves his heart enough to move his hand and after all these years she walks away from this place after all these years with an open womb and now she's finally where she has always dreamed barefoot and pregnant <laughs> i know that has negative connotations but i want to re reclaim today barefoot and pregnant in fact the title of my message is barefoot and pregnant she gives birth to a son and she calls his name Samuel which I love her she's like it's like this word play thing like it, it's kind of like similar to the name of God in Hebrew um, so but it kind of so it kind of sounds like you're calling God's name but it means that I asked the Lord for him and the name Samuel is a constant reminder to her that although while she's been trusted with him that he does not belong to her that Samuel is not hers and when I read the scripture and it gets to the part with her, oh, and he lay, she went home and she laid with her husband. I'm like, oh, yeah, let's go. And it says God remembered her. I'm like, yes, come on. And it says he opened her womb and I'm so excited. For this girl, I can't contain myself. I don't know because, you know, I know what it's like. To, to have a fertility expert look me in my face and tell me I won't be able to have kids and how that feels. So I want to celebrate for her. I'm telling you, I read this story, and when he opens her womb, I want to throw her a shower. And as soon as I can get the invitations and the decorations ready, I am thrown from celebration to grief because I am a mother. And as I read, I realize Samuel was about the same age as my son when she would have to walk him back up that hill and give him back to God. And today, I want to honor the text by processing it. I want us to process, can you imagine? Can you imagine all these years of wanting a child and then giving it back? Can you imagine Hannah has believed for him prayed for him she has fought for him in ways no one will ever know and then she's labored for him birthed him delivered him nursed him she's bonded with him she is his mommy she has taught him everything he knows he he she is the only one who can understand what he's saying because you know he can't pronounce his letters right and nobody else knows and she knows every single word he's saying she's the only one she has she has all her names for him she's changed his diaper she slept with him on her chest and woke up 500 times a night to make sure he was still breathing she is a mother of a a baby who she has held and loved as her own son because he is her son but he's not and now the time gets closer she's a real person with a real heart and a real soul and this is her son I just want to imagine I mean can you imagine like the days coming up as it gets closer and closer and you're preparing and I'm just like how how do you prepare to give away your child how do you pack 
for someone's whole life. And I'm just imagining her running around the house trying to make sure if, if I'm not going to be there, I need everything he needs. And, and what do I leave? And what do I, what do I send with him? And what do I, I need to keep something because I just need the scent of him at least to be able to smell him if I'm going to lose him. And I, and I just can't imagine. I actually can't imagine, but I try to imagine what it would be like in those final days and, and those final hours when she knew she was waking up tomorrow to give away her son. And I bet you Hannah did not sleep one wink. And when the sun rose and he was still sleeping on her chest, even at three, two, three years old, and his eyes popped open and she looked in his eyes and knew this would be the last day he ever woke up to her face. And all the questions, what, what will he think about me though? This, this is gonna be tr so traumatic and it will. He's not going to understand why I've abandoned him, and he won't. The truth is that Samuel is too young to understand what's happening, but she's not, and she has to pack up everything she has for him, strap him to her body, and walk 14 miles back up a hill, 14 miles up a hill, remembering the years of agitation, desperation, accusation, frustration, isolation, 14 miles and now he's in her arms, and that's 14 miles for the devil to try to talk her out of what she already said to God. 14 miles, she's got to go, and then she's got to come home. After two or three years of being a mom, she's going to come home to an empty house. And can you imagine that last moment? After the 14 miles, and you find your way to the door, and behind that door is a man so evil who has failed so miserably at raising his own sons that God is about to kill them all. And you're the one that I have to give my baby to. This baby is mine. Samuel, because I asked God for him. Knock, knock. And here he comes to the door. And I have to place my son in the hands of a man and trust that God can be trusted because this man cannot. And can you imagine that final handoff? And he doesn't understand what's happening. He's too young. Who is this guy? And the Bible says he was really big. Who's this big guy you're handing me to? Like, what, what's going on? And can you imagine him crying your name? Mommy, no! slams shut and you are standing on the other side of that door listening to your son cry out for you and you cannot respond because Samuel is not yours. And it's at this point in the story that I start asking myself, wait, hold up, wait, why are we doing this again? This can't be the Lord. This is not God. God is not in this. No. Why? Why are you walking 14 miles above here? Why are you going to give him back? What are you doing? And then I remember, ah, oh, that stupid vow you made. Why? Did you make that vow? You know nobody in heaven or earth asked you to make that vow. Why did you make that vow? What triggered you to make that vow? And, and it's binding now, so you have to. But if you're going to, then why at least did you, why did you only ask for a child? Why didn't you ask for more and say, I'll give you the first one? Why would you make such a crazy vow and be on this? Why does it not seem harder for you to let him go? Because what I want to see is you drop him off Fall flat on your face, cry so hard that you vomit. Because I know you got that kind of drama in you. We saw it at the temple. <laughs> she gives her child away. And the first word she says out of her mouth is, my heart rejoices in the Lord. Girl, if you don't shut up and cry... I'm, I'm confused, like I am on an emotional roller coaster and I'm drained because how could it be true? How could you want something so desperately for so long but so easily let it go? How? 
is this not harder for you? How? Because both could not be true. It can't be true that you wanted a baby so desperately, but you could just give them up so easily. Both cannot be true unless I have assumed that you wanted a child for the same reasons that I wanted a child. Unless I have assumed that you wanted a child because you wanted to have 18 years of the sound of kids in your house and feed and you wanted birthdays and you wanted bath time and you wanted Christmas with kids and you wanted all the things that I do. That's why I wanted a kid, but that couldn't be true. What if you wanted a child for a different reason than I thought? If you have spent so many years in sorrow over not having a child and you are having joy when you give him away, then what was your sorrow really about? And it's that vow that tells me the story I have been missing all these years. The vow lets me know something that I didn't realize. See, every day, she woke up in a body that was literally built to birth. And it is a terrible thing to be built to do something but locked up and hindered. It is a terrible thing to know that you have been designed and wired and created to do something, but there is something blocking and hindering, and you cannot do the very thing in your whole body. You look at it, and it tells you that you were built to do something, and you are trapped, and you are locked outside of the potential to be able to do the thing that you were called to do. And I believe at a certain point, she started off wanting children, for maybe the same reasons, and her dreamed of a life of having kids, but at some point, she got to a place where she decided, I am willing to give up my plans if it means I can just fulfill my purpose. And I want to suggest to you that Hannah's longing was not as much about just having children as it was about fulfilling her purpose. It is a terrible thing to be created to do something but hinders. The barrenness is spiritually symbolic of living outside of purpose. Here's a picture I see, then you would know this because you, you're taught the word here, and that is that we are the bride of Christ, that the church, male and female, is the bride of Christ. And here's the thing that I have seen, right? It's that God, the husband, is in heaven, and the bride is on earth. And any time he wants to do something on earth, he has chosen that the way he will do it is by finding a man or a woman. In other words, by finding a, gro a, a bride whose womb he can fill to birth what he desires on he in heaven. So when the groom wants to birth something on the earth, he does it through the womb of his bride. And it's in the natural, the womb is nothing more than a little hollow place inside of you. It's a little hole that makes you say things like, I just, I mean, I know I think it looks like I have it all, but I just want to do something that like makes a difference. I want something more rewarding. I mean, I have a paycheck and a good life and I've succeeded and I've reached all these things, but I'm still unfulfilled. Something is missing. There is a hole. And I came to tell you that that hole is there by design because it is the womb through which God will birth his purposes on the earth. And so with that in mind, we go back to our text because one of the biggest mistakes that we make in interpreting the scripture is only looking at it from the ground. When we look right here, it's like a selfie and all you can see is yourself. But you turn it around and you back it up. And today, see, in all the years that I've preached Hannah, heard Hannah preach, we have always focused on Hannah, her, her pain, her penina, her prayers, her process, everything else about Hannah and all that she endured. But our picture is so focused on Hannah. But today, we've got to back that camera up. 
And I want to go farther and further back and I want to look at it from heaven because this isn't just about having a baby and it's not just about fulfilling purpose. In fact, this story is not really about Hannah at all. When you zoom today, I want us to pull the camera back and see past Hannah, past her home, past her city and her family. And I want to go all the way back to her nation. And I want us to look not from the ground, but from heaven down, her nation, the nation of Israel. What is happening at this time in history? We have just stepped out of the book of Judges, and it is a wicked generation. I mean, the violence and the sexual perversion and the people who are being a woman being literally raped to death my god this is what is happening this is a day and age when it says every man is doing that which is right in his own eyes this is the time when there are only judges and, and the word of the lord is rare there is no voice of god and god is looking down at his people his chosen people and he sees a problem this is a problem this is a problem for me what is happening in my nation i need a solution i see i need a solution and he has a solution in his heart is the seed of Samuel. He has Samuel in his heart. I, I have a Samuel. I need a Samuel. See, I need someone to bridge the gap between judges and prophets and king. I need a Samuel. I need someone to be as the voice of God when the word of the Lord is rare. I need Samuel. I need somebody so acquainted with the voice of God that never once will any of his words fall to the ground. I need a Samuel who can walk into the house of Jesse, give a hard pass to all the other brothers, call for a shepherd, and I know when his child is keen, I need a, I need a Samuel. But, but in order for Samuel to be let I need him to be the solution, uh, he's going to have to be trained. In order for him to hear my voice so clearly that none of his words ever falls to the ground, I need him early. I'm going to have to train him. I need Samuel. I need him from like about the age of three years old. So I, I need a womb. And there's lots of women who would love to give birth and give birth to a son. But I need a different kind of woman. I, I need, I have Samuel. And I have Samuel, and I, and I, I just got to know, because I, I, I know there would be people I could give a baby. What, what kind of woman would be willing to carry, for him, carry him, labor for him, deliver him, nurse him, and then give him back? But what kind of woman would have just enough desperation? What kind of woman would have just enough agitation? What kind of woman would have not, uh, just enough isolation? What woman would have just enough walking 14 miles, just enough years. What kind of woman would have suffered enough and cried enough? What kind of woman could have been walking 14 miles long enough that she would do something so crazy and just say, forget my plans, just let me give birth and you can have him back. I need a woman like that, but who, where would I find a woman like that? What kind of woman? would have just seen enough, been so tired of watching all the other women just do the same thing, just have babies and live, that she would make up in her mind that I would be willing to sacrifice my plans and I will do anything if you will just let me give birth to purpose. See, when the Lord closed her womb, his hand created a crisis that provoked a passion, that stirred and stoked a surrender, and that took the very thing that was just hollow, and he made it hallowed. His hand was on it, and he never, he put his hand on her womb to make it holy. His hand was on her womb, and it was never there to harm her. It was there to hollow that place. He was marking that place as his own. That's my womb. This is the womb that when I get you to the right place, after you have suffered a while, I know, Hannah, see, you think you've been told that they chose, that God chose Hannah because she was sad. God didn't choose Hannah because she was sad. He chose her because she was surrendered.
Listen, my friend, that longing, that, that gnawing, that little hole inside of you that church hasn't been able to fill, success hasn't been able to fill, money hasn't been able to fill, followers hasn't been able to fill, husband and wife haven't been able to fill, that discontentment and that desire for significance or to do something that matters, that for more fulfillment, that hole is hollowed. It is set apart by God. And it is the womb through which he will birth his purposes on the earth. So now let's watch how the natural mirror, mirrors the spiritual. You can sit. Let's, let's watch. So the womb, listen to me. The womb in the natural is, is a hollow place. Now watch the mirror here. Watch, watch this. Only it is a hollow place inside of a woman. And only seed can fill it. Nothing else can fill a womb, nothing you eat, drink, inject, nothing else can fill a womb except for seed. That seed always begins inside of the Father. Purpose always begins inside of the Father. If it starts with you, it's ambition and not purpose because purpose always starts with the Father. Now, as in the natural, it is always begins, only seed can feel it, it always begins in the Father, and it is deposited through intimacy, not intellect, not a TED Talk, not a series, not a motivational speaker, not a book, nothing else. The seed of purpose is always only deposited through intimacy with the Father when you walk so closely with him that you become one. And when that hole is filled, you become what we call pregnant. And here's the thing about pregnancy that some of you know in this room. Pregnancy is beautiful and amazing, but pregnancy is a burden. It's hard being pregnant. Pregnancy is a weight inside of you that you carry and it just keeps getting heavier and heavier. And so you have days where you feel like you cannot even breathe. Pregnancy is a burden. I mean, it's exciting, but it's scary, and it's fragile, and being pregnant takes away some of your liberties because you don't get to do all the things, and, and, and just because your appetites say, I want sushi, you have to say, I have to say no to my appetites because I have to protect what is inside of me. So y'all can do what y'all do, but there's something inside of me that I have been trusted with and I have to protect it. See, being pregnant takes away some of your liberties. Being pregnant stretches you to the point where you feel like you cannot ever be stretched anymore and you know that you will never look the same when you're done. Being pregnant is beautiful, but it's a burden. And you will know God has impregnated you with purpose when you feel like a burden. Purpose doesn't feel like an adrenaline rush and dreams of me on stages and pregnancy feels like a burden. Being pregnant is you making a decision to think about something else more than you think about yourself and after pregnancy then comes the labor and labor first comes the pain and the pain drugs or no drugs the pain is real the pain is real the pain is real and after the pain comes the pressure I, I could take the pain but y'all the pressure almost took me out that pressure I don't know what to do oh what happened get this thing out of me go let's go and I pushed for three hours that baby was stuck almost passed out so many times in between it the pain and the pressure. And after the pain and the pressure comes the push. And here's the thing about the pain and the pressure. The pain and the pressure, you don't ask for them. You don't know when they're coming. You get no choice. You just sit there, and when the pain comes, it comes. And when the pressure comes, it comes. But the push is how you cooperate with the pain and the pressure. Push. 
push. And next to the modern day miracle of C-section, if you don't push, that baby will die inside of you. And some of you are wondering why you've been stuck in cycles of pain, pressure, and depression. Pain, pressure, and depression because God was trying to birth something to you and you never pushed. So pain came and the pressure came and you are stuck in these cycles because you are standing on the grave of things that you cannot see. Beneath your feet are things that God wanted to birth through you and they died beneath your feet. And you don't know why you're depressed. Pain, pressure, and you did not cooperate with the push. The pain and the pressure are God's way of telling you it's time. See, when Hannah was at that table, something shifted after all these years of pain. She had been in labor for a long time. And after all these years of pain, something shifted and that pain moved to pressure and something happened. And that's why after 14, 15, 16 years of sitting the table, the same table, something happened. She did something different. This is she, she felt the shift. She felt an urgency and she said, no, 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 I have to push. And so she pushed her chair away from the table and she pushed her way to the presence of God and she pushed her way past the offense of a pastor calling her drunk and she pushed and she pushed and she pushes her way and that temple that place with the presence of God was her delivery room and she pushed past the offense when he called her a drunkard and she pushed and she pushed and she pushed so hard that something came out of her mouth that she didn't even know where it came from because when you're pushing you say stuff you don't even know where it came from and that is that stupid vow because she was in labor and she pushed and that vow was the sound of Samuel's first cry and she left that place, her face no longer downcast, and she was hungry. Why? Because she wasn't pregnant yet, but she had just given birth. Because when God looks to birth his purposes on the earth, he is always looking for a person who will carry it, labor for it, birth it, and then give it back. Never see it as their own. God says, can I birth something through you and you name it after me? Samuel, can, you, can I birth something af through you and you name it after me and then you walk it back up a hill and give it back? Samuel, a reminder to her soul every time she called his name that although she has been trusted with him he's not mine he is God's God didn't choose Hannah because she was sad he chose her because she was surrendered and he has always looked to birth his purposes through people who will give them back when God wanted to birth Samuel he found a woman who would take him and walk her only son up a hill and offer him back. When God wanted to birth a nation called Israel, he found a man who he could give a son and he would walk that son up a hill and offer him back. And a nation was born on a hill where a man took that which God gave him and offered it back. And when God wanted to birth Jesus, and I know you've heard he chose Mary because she was pure, but you have been lied to because all the girls her age were pure. Purity wasn't rare. Surrender was rare. And some of you have disqualified yourself because someone has convinced you that God is looking for a woman who is just pure and has never touched this world. But baby, God can get a hold of any womb as long as it is surrendered. So when God wanted to birth 
Jesus, he found a woman. And he chose her because she was surrendered enough to offer up her reputation, to offer up her dreams of what life looked like, to offer up and live life on the run, to give birth in a barn, to love him, to nurse him, to tie his shoes, to kiss his owies goodbye, and to stay up late nights with him. She was surrendered enough to stay near to the cross when everyone else left, but still resist the urge to run and throw her body between the whip and her baby's back. She was surrendered enough to stay near to the cross, but never try to interfere with the thing that God had called him to do. She was surrendered enough so when God wanted to birth Jesus, he found a woman who would walk up a hill and through tears would offer him back. And when God wanted to birth salvation, when he wanted to birth sons and daughters, he chose a man called Jesus who he could give a body. Jesus would walk up a hill and offer that body back. You see, Jesus gave birth on a cross. Stripped naked, he was barefoot and pregnant. And on the cross, he labored. And a sword broke his water on the cross. And he pushed through the pain, and he pushed through the offense, and it was ugly, but it was holy because he was giving birth. And that day, we were born again like a newborn baby covered in blood. We were born covered in his blood. And they never washed us off. Like a newborn baby, we were born covered in his blood. And they never cleaned us off. And you hear him at the very end say to God, it is finished what's finished, not the story, but the thing that you sent me here to birth. It's finished. I have carried it to completion. And then he said, into your hands I commit my spirit. And with his last breath, he took the breath God gave him. And he gave it back. See, Jesus' last breath was the sound of the church's first cry. We were delivered on a cross. We were delivered on a cross. A man took the very breath God gave him and he walked it up a hill and he gave it back. Now here's the scary thing. When God wanted to birth deliverance for his people, for Israel, he found Moses. And it was a burning bush. It was a moment of intimacy. And he said, I want to do something. I want to birth something through you, Moses. And then he told Moses, take off your shoes. And there he stood, barefoot and pregnant. The ground was holy. The scary part is that God wanted to birth it through him. But although Moses saw heaven, he never saw the delivery room. And he never got to go to the promised land. God had to find another womb. And when did that happen? It was something that seemed so significant. God puts a staff in his hand. He says, I want to birth something in earth. I want water to come out of that rock. And he says, Moses, speak to the rock. And Moses strikes the rock. And the gift works. It's just, just because something works doesn't mean it's blessed. You can look at a lot of people. They got a gift from God. And it's working. And you may have drank that water from that rock yourself. But you don't even know that God has already rejected them. This simple thing, speak to the rock, no, struck the rock. When God put something in Moses' hand, 
And Moses decided that he got to decide how to use it. What he was saying to God was, this is not yours, it's mine. And when he took the thing that God called him to carry, and he miscarried it, he miscarried it. Because the thing that God put in his hand, he decided was his own. And when God wants to birth something in the earth, he has always looked for a person who will carry it, birth it, and give it back. So the lie is that purpose is this one big thing that you figure out one day and, oh, I figured out how to release it. And I'm one of the minority who figured it out. And the truth is, purpose is a constant cycle of birthing. It's a cycle of being so intimate with the, the Father that in a moment, if he wants to birth something through you, oh, you feel an urgency, oh, buy that person's groceries and you, and you birth it, yes. You just say yes and you give it back to God. I don't know what you're gonna do with it. It's not mine, it's yours. It's constant cycles of just watching, walking so intimately the, with the Father that he knows that if I need a womb, I know which one to go through. I know where the wombs are that have been hollowed. I know the place that I can go where there are people who are surrendered and they are scarred, but they're surrendered. Purpose, listen to me if you hear nothing else I say today, purpose is not about you discovering your gift. It is discovering your offering. <laughs> Purpose is not about finding your gift. It's about finding your offering. Some things you will carry for decades. There are things that I'm still carrying that you can't see, but I can feel the weight of. And I've been carrying them for decades. And then there's other things that sometimes God's purpose for my life is a sermon. And I labor for it, y'all. And I pray and I study and I, and then when I'm done, I give it back to God. And you know what, today this is the purpose of God from my life and when I get home Monday the purpose of God from my life will be to teach my children to love the Lord with all their hearts with all their mind their soul and their strength purpose is not this big elusive thing it is a constant cycle of being so intimate with God that he can come to you at any moment he wants and he knows that you will deliver it and give it back so today, some of you are like Hannah, and you've walked for so long, longer than you can even remember, with this longing and this aching, and the revelation for you today is that maybe you have been just waiting on God, but God has just been waiting on a vow. What would have happened, Jackie, if God initiated in your heart an invitation to do something like this? and you decided that you got to just do it your way. And you didn't follow God's leading and you just brought the biggest name that you could find and you didn't leave God. This, this moment wouldn't have happened because I'm not a big name. If God does anything in this session through you, it is because this woman fulfilled the purpose of God for her life. Some of you are like Hannah, and God has just been waiting for you get, yeah, I, I wanna give it to you, I wanna give it to you, but you gotta get to a place. I'm not moving my hand till you move my heart. And the thing that moved my heart is surrender. And some of you, others of you are like Mary, because today, you aren't even thinking about giving birth. And I come like a voice just as shocking to you as the angel Gabriel, just turning your whole world upside down. And God is saying to every person under the sound of my birth, could I grow something in you? And you would labor for it. And you would love it. 
but she would name it after me and give it back. There is a spiritual barrenness plaguing the church because birth is being choked out by ambition. And I'm praying in the name of Jesus that that will not be so for your life. I want to pray for you. I'm sure I've gone past my time. I don't even know what time it is. I wonder if there's anyone because Hannah had to, she had to get up. She had to leave the place where she was and move somewhere different. She was going to be barren there, barren here, but at least here I have an opportunity. I wonder if there is someone in here who feels a stirring like Hannah at that table, like an urgency that you would get to the place where you would get out of your chair and run down to this altar and say, God, I will give up my plans, but I, I, I just pray, God, uh, if I release my plans, I need to fulfill my purpose. God, I've got to fulfill my purpose. I've got to fulfill my purpose. An altar is not just a place where we do emotional things. Altar is a place of sacrifice. It's a place things go to die. No one told Hannah what to say. What do you want to say to God, my sister? What do you want to say to God right now? Aren't you tired? I mean, you tried everything. And all your plans haven't failed. What if that hole that you have been trying so hard to fill comes with the death and the release of the thing that you find your definition in? thing that has become what defines you, what would happen if you offered it back. The Lord God searches hearts. Holy Spirit, right now you're doing something different. You're doing something unique and pure. Talk over you, Holy Spirit. Speak to your daughters.
Senhor, Senhor. Jesus mighty 
you guys have enjoyed tonight. Tonight was so, so, so special. Katie Kazadi really brought the heat, and I pray you guys were impacted by tonight's message. Go ahead, share this stream with a friend so that somebody else can be blessed by it as well. And all every night I've been telling y'all about Permission World. You gotta, gotta, gotta jump in to continue this conversation. There's so many different ladies in there bringing all kinds of flavor and fire and conversations um, to continue to encourage each other in the Lord. So make sure you join Permission World tonight. And don't forget, I'm telling you once again, Permission Room applications drop this Friday. So drjackiegreed.com, get your application in, and we hope to see you there. See y'all tomorrow.
they're not adequate enough for. Sometimes heaven invades the earth in a way that you don't have adequate earthly words to be able to respond. This is a holy moment. This is a moment where no woman walked in and left the same. He has heard the cries of his people. A generation of women that desire to live free. And he is breaking down every barrier. He's pushing back darkness. And he is declaring, these right here are mine, mine, all oh, mine. No more backing down. No more intimidation. No more fear. We will have what he said. The devil is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But the God of truth. The God of truth. The God of truth. Oh, he did.
Well, I hope you guys have enjoyed tonight. Tonight was so, so, so special. Katie Kazadi really brought the heat, and I pray you guys were impacted by tonight's message. Go ahead, share this stream with a friend so that somebody else can be blessed by it as well. And all, every night I've been telling y'all about Permission World. You gotta, gotta, gotta jump in to continue this conversation. There's so many different ladies in there bringing all kinds of flavor and fire and conversations um, to continue to encourage each other in the Lord. So make sure you join Permission World tonight. And don't forget, I'm telling you once again, Permission Room applications drop this Friday. So drjackiegreed.com, get your application in, and we hope to see you there. See y'all tomorrow.